they bring in daily horse loads of berries and several kinds of roots, the most abundant and most prized of which is small, white, extremely bitter of taste, and called by the Indians, Spatham. It is found in great plenty in the plain of, and gives name to, the Bitter Root River. During our stay here, we were employed in trading our goods for the only articles we wanted, namely beaver and provisions. The best articles in our equipment for this purpose was cut glass beads, with which the dress of the females are decorated. William Angus Ferris, Fur Trapper, 1835. And so, following on the heels of Lewis and Clark, came the fur trappers. At the time, European gentlemen of wealth wore hats made of beaver felt. However, by 1840, the hats started to fall out of fashion, and there was little money left to be made in fur trapping. Also, it was getting increasingly hard to find beaver. Shortly, however, homesteaders from the east began to arrive. What they wanted was the land, especially the rich bottom land. Thus, the original inhabitants, the Bitterroot Salish, were pushed out. They were relocated to a reservation 75 miles to the north. This reservation is where they remain to this day. Many Salish children were sent to Catholic mission boarding schools, where they were taught only in English. Sometimes they were even given new names. I was born in Arlie, 1916. My name's Agnes Kenmo, but uh, I go by Ushne Kenmo. That's my Indian name, it's Ushne. That's my real name. Agnes was just, when I went to school, I didn't know how to say Virginia, but that's, that's Ushne. But i rather go by Oshne instead of Virginia. I like Oshne. I'm Salish. I'm from Bitterroot. My mother was three years old when they had to move, move out of there. From Stevensville to Arlie. In the early 1900s, during the spring, many Salish would journey south from the reservation to the Bitterroot Valley or the plains of Missoula to gather Bitterroots. My mother and my brother-in-law would drive us to Missoula and, and wagon. We'd take teepee poles with us. A rough road, you know, that time, it's got to be in the 20s. Takes us all day to, to get there, but we'll, we get there, though. The old people, if you can just imagine them, traveling in buggies and horseback, you know, going to Irk and taking a whole day to get to the Bitterroot field and camping over. We used to camp in Missoula, where Shopko was at. Shopko in that area too, there was, there was a big open field there. And if you look into town today, right where the tree line starts at, you know, the old oak trees are at out there, that was the edge of town then. My dad had an old truck. He used to throw all our stuff in there and it'd take us, take us to Shopco. <laughs> that was our Shopco then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had a great big camp east of Kmart. There were lot, 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 lots of people a long time ago. A lot of Indians, I mean. Teepees were scattered, but there were lots of teepees and they were just bittered all over. All the Indians would be digging. Big, big camp. Not only is it just four or five teepees, it'd be hundreds of people digging because it's only lasts about two weeks. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, after that, they all come back home, to, back to Arli. My grandma used to talk about her parents when they'd dig bitterroot. But she used to talk about all that. See that big mountain right behind the university? is Nampui, they call it Nampui. But there was bitterroot all over in that country, she said. Digging was mainly the women's job. That was their winter supply of food, you know. That was important for the elders then. 
and Sophie Moise would usually be with us too. She was the one that prayed for the Bitterroot. She goes out and just kind of keeps track of it. She has the right to dig one and check it out to see if it's, if it had the right time when, it, when the skin peels off of the roots, so it just peels easy. Then she passes the, the, the word on to the, to the chief or to the people, and then, uh, then the runners run out and send the word out that there's gonna be the feast probably tomorrow or so, because it, it has to be done right away. They can't say, well, we'll wait till the weekend, you know. <laughs> it has to be done right away. So a group will go out to the midroot fields and they'll be in a circle there. They'll find one of the bitterroot that looks looks good. They'll select the one and so they put the the root digger, the petze in the ground right there where the where the root is at. Then the person that's in charge of it will go ahead and start to to talk to this and welcoming it. So they pull it out of the ground and they peel it and then they'll talk to it again and say, We welcome you back or happy to see you and I hope that you'll be plentiful for all of us. Then we start digging, digging bitter. But uh, as you dig them, you, you also clean them, because if you don't, they'll be hard to peel. As soon as you get them out of the ground is, is usually the best time. My mother even went to blacksmith and got little tiny a uh, bitter digger. It was about that big. I bet I was about eight years old. So I was digging bitter myself. Play around, then go back and dig. <laughs> and got to peel them, you know. You, you dig so much, and then later you, you peel them. Once in a while you'll see a coyote across the field, you know, or maybe Maybe even a deer wander across, you know, where you're at, you know, in a, in a quietness you're digging. We have a, a feast after we dig. So they gather enough just for a pot, about a pot full, and they bring it back to the, to the feast area. Everything is being prepared already. The people are there already. People are all sitting around waiting for the group to get there. So this stuff is put into the broth, maybe into the deer broth or something that's cooked. And uh, when it's done, then it's brought out to the table and set out for the, usually for the chief, the elders. And, and, it's, and it's treated as if, a, as if it was a human being. And people in the community got up and talked to it, for it, welcoming it back and asking blessings for, for all of us, for our children, that we'll all be healthy this year, that the crop will be plentiful for all of us. Different people have different ways of preparing bitterroot. And my folks, and my grandparents, always just cooked them in, in water, and then they'd, uh, they'd mix service berries in with them. That was my family's favorite way. The traditional method of, of storage and preserving it was to dry it, dry it in the sun. And when I was a child, my mother explained to me that long ago, a woman of good standing is one that had very white bitterroot and a lot of it. They'd usually put a canvas out, lay them out in the sun. They also last forever then. So that was uh, part of your winter's food. We gather sacks and sacks of bitterroot. We have that all winter. You know, during the winter, uh, all my folks, we, we ate that. It was part of our subsistence you know and me I don't have to subsist on it now but uh, I, I like to have some bitter every once in a while all year long however times continued to change for the Salish people they collect a bitter root up in bitter root valley that that's why they call that bitter root uh, over in Hamilton that whole place there was just nothing but bitter root until the uh, people come in there and they started plowing and doing other things, you know. I think that's why a lot of people don't go looking anywhere because, I don't know, 
it's it's hard to even drive up to somebody's home and ask permission to go dig bitterroot, you know. I sometimes I erase all the buildings that are around there and I still see in in my own mind what what was there. Uh, because the the bitter digging areas went clear to Fort Missoula. Like my great grandmother, Mary Ann Combs, you know, she used to dig down in, into the Hamilton area. There was a place that she used to dig at. And uh, people that owned it, you know, used to tell her, come on in, go ahead. But time went along and uh, people sold out. So she was, I took her down that one year to dig and she got turned away. And there was, a, there was a sign on the gate, no trespassing. And so we went to ask permission and they said no. And she was really heartbroken from that. <laughs>